it's wonderful to uh, have you here today. It's our last in conversation before our summer break. Uh, some of you might not know me. I'm Isabel Fish, and I'm the founder of Rupigal. We are a collective of women who support craft and uh, the makers and artisans. For the past 15 months, we have been holding these in conversations, and they have taken us into um, the studios, the ateliers, the galleries of incredible, exceptional, creative minds. And today is no different. My guests today are London jeweler Vicky Embury Smith and Chicago architect Brad Lynch. Thank you so much, both of you, for, uh, for having us today and for welcoming us into your space. I see that you are both uh, big readers, apparently, <laughs> from your backgrounds. <laughs> um, before, uh, before I start, I just want to encourage the audience to put your questions in the chat box. I will be taking the questions as we go along and trying to um, incorporate them into our conversation. So, um, Vicky and Brad, before we uh, start, I thought I would ask a couple of quick answer questions to each one of you to, um, to establish the playing field. Brad, do you own a wear jewelry? I own a what? I'm sorry? Do you own or wear jewelry? Uh, I do not wear jewelry. I rarely wear a watch. I wore a watch today for the first time in about a year and a half. <laughs> and do you gift it? Do you I do. Gift yeah. jewelry? I do. You do. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Vicky, what kind of building do you live in? <laughs> it's a Victorian, uh, well, Edwardian terraced house. Uh, in North London, England. And uh, when you are on holiday or when you are out and about, what kind of building gives you a frisson, makes you go inspired uh, and... Uh, work. When, when I go traveling, or you mean places that I stay in? Oh, well, I suppose the, the best place that I, that I stayed in was a Palladian uh, villa in uh, Verona in, in Italy. Uh, and that was for my 60th birthday, which was just a fantastic treat. Um, Perfect. So, uh, I mean, we paired together jewelry and, uh, and architecture, which I know um, uh, came a bit as a surprise to, to you, Brad, and to some other people. It was very much inspired by the work of Vicky. And when I was doing um, a little bit of research, I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, I, um, I went into, um, you know, the principles. And I was absolutely astonished to see, I know this is not an extensive and exhausting list of the principles um, of either jewelry or architecture, but they are already so, com so many uh, common points, which I really think are uh, incredible. Oh, uh, uh, someone is not. Uh... So, I wanted to, um, I'm going to share some slides of your various work. And if you could please comment um, on each one of them, and maybe we can go into the, uh, the principles there. Vicky, this ring is one of your iconic pieces. And what I try to do here is only a visual, if you want approximation of the shape of this ring and the work uh, on this image of the uh, work of Brad. But can you tell us a little bit more about this piece, Vicky? Uh, this ring was uh, commissioned by uh, a lady who used to live in Oxford, uh, it, and she worked in, in the right in the centre of Oxford. And she commissioned this for her tenth wedding anniversary. So I like to think of it as a biographical ring. It tells a story of part of her life. So starting from the left, we have old Oxford and the iconic buildings, and then in the middle is St. Ed's, the church where she got married. Uh, and then as we go along to the right, um, it's the road where she lived on, Turn Again Lane, what a great name. And her car, her 2CV is parked outside. So it, it right. tells the whole story of, of where she worked, she married, where she lived. Um, uh, of course, it's not geographically correct, but I played around with the other. <laughs> Uh, and Brad, this uh, this is the rendering, I think, from uh, uh, work that you did. 
this is a, um, a, a pro bono project that I worked on in Paranapia, Caba, Brazil. And it was for um, trying to find out a way, uh, it's in the Atlantic rainforest in the state of Santo Andre, or the city of Santo Andre in the state of Sao Paulo. And um, the, we were trying to think of ways of developing an old roadway there next to a historic town that would allow uh, the town to be restored in terms of having new economic development without encroaching onto the, um, into the rainforest, which is, is a big ordeal that's happening down there. Uh, Vicky, you'd probably be interested in this town, Paranapiacaba, because it was an English mining town. And uh -huh. uh, it was where the first uh, game of soccer was played in Brazil, huh. or football oh. for you. Oh, and it's oh, a big oh. soccer day today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, <laughs> today Bring it home, England. England. Today, <laughs> England is playing in the uh, in the Euro Cup. <laughs> so, um, do you do a lot of uh, pro bono work, Brad? Uh, we do. Yes. Uh, we do. Um, well, I wouldn't say a lot. I mean, we probably do one project per year. Uh, we're currently working on. Um, project in Washington, D.C. for the uh, Washington Police Department for, for at-risk children that are taken out of dangerous uh, crime scenes uh, and then housed and counseled and, and have uh, therapy. Right. Um, the next uh, slide is, uh, again, I picked uh, two pieces. Maybe this time we can start with you, Brad. I, I, I find this image mesmerizing. Well, this is looking up one of our residential towers. Um, there, there are concrete cantilevered balconies outside the building. And uh, this is not a view that we really thought of uh, when we were doing the building. But when I saw the photograph, it, it reminded me of the Salk Institute um, in California. So the, uh, we like to use this image a lot. Mm -hmm. Can I ask which way you, are we looking? We're looking, from, we're looking at the ground up. Right. So these are protruding balconies off the balcony. So you're looking at the bottom of the, of the balconies. Yes. So we have, how many um, material do we have here, Brad, when we look at this image? You have um, glass, uh, you have concrete, you have uh, perforated metal, and you have, um, uh, uh, it's a um, artificial terracotta-like material. That's the white material that you see there. That's the wet material here, which would be the, the floor, is that right? That, well, it's a wall or a... Yeah, that would be the, a, it'd be the uh, division between the floors, yes. That's right. Um, and the similarity or the, uh, the recall, Vicky, with your piece, which is the inside of the design of this box, um, was just too good to pass. What is this piece? <laughs> it's a box based on St. Stephen's Walbrook, uh, which is a church right in the centre of London. Uh, said to be Christopher Wren's second favorite building. You can guess which his first one might be. Um, but this one, uh, I think you have another picture of it, will explain the whole building. Here we're looking into the bottom of the box and the lid is in the forefront. Uh, the bottom of the box has the uh, ground floor plan etched into the bottom. Uh, if I make a box, I like to have, as it were, a kind of surprise or a reward inside for opening it. Uh, the box. So you open it up and I hope there's a bit of a wow factor. So there's the floor plan. The, the mystery. Yes. Um, and now this one, um, even though these two uh, pieces don't have the same shape, but to me they have the same uh, feel. Vicky, this is a reproduction of um, a construction, a building at the, the London Zoo, is that correct? That's right. It's the, based on the penguin pool in the zoo which is a uh, building from 1932 by Bertolt Lübetkin, uh, one of the many uh, German uh, refugee emigres to England uh, just before the war. Um, and it was designed as a playground for the penguins, which we all like, but the penguins weren't so happy with it. Sadly, they weren't taken by the spiral slides there, but it's a very iconic building. And it's one that, well, all architects definitely know about and any visitor to the zoo will know. So the actual building, if you looked from um, 
a bird's eye view, not a penguin view, uh, you'd see a kind of oval shape. And I've taken a longitudinal view through that uh, oval shape uh, with a cross section so that you get a look at all the different elements. So it's by way of telling the whole building, what it does, what it is. And although it's nothing like the actual building, it's instantly recognizable to anybody who knows it. Mm. Uh, um, and, and Brad, you created, I mean, this building is the, uh, the museum in Racine, Wisconsin, which is a craft museum uh, for which you received many, many awards. Uh, and I'm interested to see that it's a, a craft museum because it doesn't look like it's something that one would want to touch for whatever reason for me it it looks like something that we look at but is a little bit uh, forbidden it's a little bit um, uh, keeping us away um, is it just the photo that does that well um it's funny one of the one of the major donors to that museum um, was uh, chastised by the director when she went to back and tried to touch her work after giving it to the museum so the, the you know it, you know, because now it is part of the collection and, right. and not hers, but you know, she was used to touching it and picking it up and, 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 and feeling it and so forth. So uh, the, the goal of this museum was, was basically to, it's the largest contemporary craft museum in the US. And uh, the, the goal was actually to talk about it in terms of uh, that, that it is about making things. And um, this, this building was a compilation of seven different structures that were dated back to the Civil War era. And, uh, you know, after we were all done kind of putting this back together, it wasn't a very large budget. And uh, so we clad the building in plastic and, um, and then backlit it. And, uh, and then the materials that we used in the, in the interior were fairly simple. We used recycled tires for flooring uh, and then with a, with a covering over it. And, um, it was more about how we brought light in and where the the objects were allowed to have natural light and which ones were not in terms of the placement of the galleries so mm -hmm. you know textiles and, and um, paper and, and photographs are completely different in terms of archival storage or display than um, jewelry or glass or ceramics and right. it, depending what the the individual material is but um, it was more of a response to uh, trying to revitalize the downtown, um, which had seen better days, and then also make the display very public. So this photograph, there's um, the whole wall of translucent glass behind the, the glass facing the street. There is a gallery behind that. But unlike a lot of other museums, what we did is we put the art right into the face of the street. So these two hoolies run um, about 100 feet uh, well, about 70 feet down um, and uh, are backlit by the, the light that's from the galleries. And the opposite is true during the daytime. And mm -hmm. the idea was to bring the, the art to the public um, rather than waiting until you get in the museum and so to kind of invite people into the museum. Mm. Uh, I mean, so you mentioned uh, uh, history here and you are both, um, history has is playing a large a role or has been playing a large role in your practices. I mean, Brad, you started uh, your career restoring uh, Frank Lloyd Wright houses, including the Herbert Jacobs house, which is now uh, a UNESCO World Heritage Building. And you, Vicky, you know, your uh, inspiration comes from Romanesque and Renaissance buildings. You are inspired now by also Frank Lloyd Wright and Miss Van der Rohe, but what does history play role uh, play in your uh, practice? Do, do you need, do you feel that it's always there? Uh, are you moving away from it? Do you feel that you can uh, take it and convert it? And Brad, maybe we can start with you because we've just spoken about the museum. Uh, well, I try to ignore history as much as possible, but it's always hard to do. And the, the you know, there, there's certain influences that in terms of what you study, what you read, uh, what you look at, um, has an enormous effect uh, in, in terms of you that is intrinsic to your work. I mean, you just can't, you know, get rid of it. So uh, you're always moving away from um, uh, trying to do something individual and something uh, unique uh, with your own work. But 
there's no denying that there's historical basis for any of the work that I do. I mean, there's, there's, um, I'd be hard pressed to say that everything is completely original. Um, right. And what would be your, uh, the, the period that um, is closest to your heart? I don't really have any favorites to tell you the truth. I, I, I live in um, probably one of the great modern architecture cities in the world, if not the greatest. And, the, and, and I'm surrounded by great modern architecture, but there's also great 19th century architecture here as well after the fire. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of Guerin Guarini in, in Italy. And, um, you know, I've, I've done the um, Palladio tour a, a number of times. Um, so the, the and uh, I, I, I can't say that I uh, have a particular favorite of anything. I really enjoy going to the Parthenon and I, you know, it's like the, but in, some people would say, well, how does that connect to your work? And it, it's not literally connected to my work, but it is connected to my work because the, the proportions, the work, the, the thought that goes into it and everything is, is, is extremely important, not only to the person at the time, but now the people visiting back and uh, to, to look at it. And so for me, um, it, it's not a matter of the historic style necessarily, or the piece of history. Um, it's the matter of how the skill was uh, developed by the architect at the time. And uh, I'm not a believer that old buildings, just because they're old, are good. Um, there's a lot of de-architects in, in, in buildings that are old, but the, the, the uh, but there's absolutely wonderful and, and uh, gracious and, and uh, uh, inspirational buildings that, are, that have history to them. And do you go back to when you do? Do you ever do research to go back to techniques or to drawings, or or that has uh, that, that is not relevant anymore? Not really. I mean, you know, like one of the reasons that I um, really like Guerrero Grini, who is a, a, a late Baroque architect in Italy. Um, he did the uh, the uh, cathedral in Turin that where they housed the uh, the shroud of the Turin. And uh, I believe it burned down not that long ago when they were trying to rebuild it, but the, um, it's in the late Baroque. And so there's a lot of ornament on the building. But if you were to strip the ornament off that building entirely, both on the interior and the exterior, the spatial composition would still be amazing in terms of its proportions, in terms of its scale, in terms of the way that light affects it. Um, so it, it's, it's, um, it, it's a personal favorite of mine, actually. Um, but the, the, it's nothing like my work and I don't research that type of thing because those building principles right. and, and techniques and so forth aren't used anymore. Right. I mean, for you, Vicky, it's a little bit more uh, obvious, I would say, uh, what inspires you because your work is a bit more representative. I know that you have, for example, one of your uh, uh, boxes with you and maybe you can, you can show it um, to the camera. Uh, yes. Uh... This is a box based, can you see? Yeah, um, we can see it really well. Uh, based on um, a palazzo and the Grand Canal in Venice. Um, and uh, I, I'm often asked to make uh, things for a special occasion or, or an anniversary or whatever, um, based on the place, either uh, where people lived or big anniversary. Uh, this is a card maquette of a box that I made based on a house that a couple lived in for 49 years of their 50 year marriage. And this was the um, 50th wedding anniversary present to themselves. Uh, so, so your challenges uh, are, are slightly different because you don't, um, you don't it, those are not exact reproduction to scale. No, um, not at all, not, not at all. Um, I'm trying to get character place. Uh, not miniaturization. The, the couple who commissioned this, first of all, wanted the entire house. And they showed me around and they showed me the back of the house, which is also very nice. Um, but I said, if we do the whole house, what you'll see predominantly is the roof. And nobody's familiar with the roof of their house. What you're familiar with is the front door and the facade that you enter and leave by. That's your connection with the house. Uh, the same with, with this palazzo. What you see is the facade from the Grand Canal. Uh, 
I've taken the chimneys off here. Who's going to care? You don't need the chimneys. Um, these chimneys actually are half the height they really are, but they're tall enough for this. But also you're looking at the building from a different angle. And so with this facade, I've made it slightly taller because actually from the water level canal, it would look very tall. But on a table or a shelf, it's going to, you're going to probably be looking down on it. So I manipulate the proportion in order to end up with the thing looking right. Uh, so I take a right. liberty with that. And um, as to, they, sorry. Go, no, go ahead. I was going to say, we, we have a question uh, from the audience here. Um, uh, Dina says, Alain de Botton says we shape and are shaped by our surroundings, our identity is linked to and shifts all with location. Um, does jewelry work that way? Does jewelry, well, I suppose the, the jewelry that you wear, you can't, can't get much more personal than wearing a thing. It's part of you, whether it's every day or occasional, but uh, it's a part of how you represent yourself to the world. So it doesn't come much more personal than that. Um, so if somebody's wearing uh, a brooch, actually, I haven't made a brooch for anyone's house. I think that might be a bit like wearing your mortgage on your shoulder. I don't know, <laughs> but I haven't done so. Not, but I have made people's houses on a ring, which is a very different item than a brooch that's like a small picture on the wall. Um, so uh, yes, it's very much of your surroundings and. The pieces that I do will connect uh, the person with the place for a special occasion. Do you, um, connecting that and, and it's, it's linked to the concept of, of passing on to the concept of the longe longevity of uh, an object, which is very much a, a craft uh, value. Do you take that into consideration when you have a commission that it's gonna be passed on uh, to the yes. next generation? You do? Definitely. And once they're made, once they exist, I hope, Brad, this is the same for you, then they're going to outlive me, I hope. Um, I, I think and hope they'll always, oh, well, who knows, always exist unless they get lost. I mean, I think in archaeological terms, it's the jewellery that tells what was, was going on in the society at that time. It's probably going to be who knows what kind of scrapyards full of computers when eventually one day with our society. but. Um, uh, jewelry tells a lot about the people that lived at that time, so it it's too contemporary at the moment to know quite how it reflects the time we're in, because we're still in it. But maybe further on, that'll become more obvious. So that that idea of um, of passing on has in our uh, society anyway, certainly in North America has um, has disappeared when it comes to the family home. Would you say that, Brad? But we're going back to the multi-generational uh, unit, living unit. Do you think that's going to turn the tide in terms of passing on to the next generation? Because you could have three generations living in a house and maybe it would make sense to pass it on. I'm not sure. Are you asking me? Um, yes, I, I am. I think, I think that um, uh, multi-generational housing is a very smart idea. Uh, in, in, in many different ways in terms of uh, using less energy, uh, in terms of uh, less travel. Um, you know, there, there, there's a lot of really good reasons for multi-generational housing. I think the days of passing on houses uh, is over. Um, I, I don't think you'll ever see that coming back again, particularly for urban and suburban houses. It's, it's a real estate market. It's not... Um, uh, it, it, it's not a, a value necessarily, and, and the, the whole economics of owning a home uh, it, it has changed dramatically in the last hundred years in terms of what does home ownership mean, what does it mean financially, what does it mean in terms of mortgage, tax write-off, etc. It, it's become its own economic indicator, you know, for um, the people, and it's not about uh, it, there's always exceptions to this, but it, in general, it's not about um, you know the homestead anymore um, or the farm. Uh, it, it's about it's an economic consideration, and the only exception I think I spoke with this to you before is that, um, and, and particularly in a place like Canada, is the cottage. 
So uh, the the um, and looking at everybody today in terms of their age group, I would say that um, when when all your parents are dying, um, the, the they they're not fighting over the house in the city, they're fighting tooth and nail for use of the old family cottage up at the lake. And the reason that is, is because it was the time that you, uh, you had the greatest emotional connection to your family undisturbed uh, and, and your memories are ingrained in that, no matter what, how dilapidated it is or uh, need of repair. Um, it's the one thing that siblings fight about you know, in terms of, of, of ownership because there's an emotional connection to it. And yeah. typically there's not an emotional connection to an urban house or uh, even a suburban one at this point. And the argument for sustainability would not um, push things toward that passing on of the house because I, 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 again, I don't think I don't think people think that way anymore. I, right. I, I don't. And I think it's more of an economic issue, uh, and, and in terms of what real estate value is, there's always exceptions. You know, there's always people that think differently, uh, but you know, I would say 99% of the population doesn't think of their home as a homestead anymore. They think of it as uh, as an investment. Right. Mm. Um, process with creative mind is always fascinating. So I, I always like to dive into that. And um, I read a quote from you, Brad, where you say, um, you were asked about your process and you say, perhaps the most important thing for me is to get up in the morning. Um, so I don't want to be nosy, but can you expand on that and tell us how it thinks to your process? Well, I always uh, like to get up in the morning and realize that I'm still alive um, and uh, that the day is ahead of me. And, um, you know, it's like, and I can get to work. So the, the um, uh, I guess it's existential, but the, the, um, uh, the, the process is, uh, in terms of my daily routine is I typically get up, you know, in my apartment um, very early. And I probably do three hours of uh, correspondence. And then uh, if I'm really energetic, I go to the gym and then uh, otherwise I go straight to the office and I work probably until early evening. And then I usually entertain or go out with clients and then uh, read a little bit, um, try and watch So something. when That's do the ideas day. come in? What's when, that? Okay, so in that very busy schedule, when mm. is the spark happening? When when is the idea formulating itself? When when is it coming together? You have a project; it's on your mind, and there's got to be some kind of time of ripening and maturing. And uh, when is that happening? And and how is it happening? That's a constant for me. I'm always sketching. I'm always. Um, uh... Uh, if my bartender was really smart, he would have kept all my napkins over the years. Um, <laughs> but the, the, uh, the, you know, the, if you have an idea, you work on it. And it's like, I think most of the ideas that I have are things that I constantly work on over the course of years. I mean, one of the, one of the um, issues with architecture is that uh, your relationship with the client is for years. And the process of building is over years just for one project. So... Um, you know, there, there's a bit of a, a time warp in our life because um, it's not like I crank out a drawing and all of a sudden, you know, if you're done with it, you're, you're involved in this very complicated process that on a larger building can involve a thousand people over a course of, you know, three, four or five years. And the, the, and, uh, and, and, and each part of the process has a, a different aspect or the, the, the most rewarding and um, I think uh, is the beginning and the end. You know, it's like, uh, you know, you come up with a concept design and then you show people the original sketches and everything and they go, oh, that looks just like that. And um, surprise. <laughs> so the, um, you know, but that comes from uh, a lot of experience and a lot of years of work and uh, doing a lot of different projects. Now the relationship with the client is very important to both of you, but uh, for you, Vicky, where you create these objects that are worn on the body or that that live on the shelves of people's homes for generations, that relationship is very special, isn't it? Yes, and and very personal, very personal. Um, uh, you're 
entering a moment in their lives when they're celebrating something or it might be in, in memory and sometimes it's a, a memento mori and I don't even know that the person is dying at time or has died and that that, that can happen so it's a huge honor to be in, involved in the family at, at those moments um, and of course some of my customers come back uh, uh, over different times uh, and for uh, perhaps different generations where it might have been a, a, a christening thing to start with and then it's a graduation present or a 21st present and then it's a wedding present and, and so on as the family grows up that can happen. Um, Let's have so, a look yes. at, um, you sent me these, uh, these photos of, of this very special ring and I think that it shows a little bit what your process is to it. Yes. It's a really special ring so maybe um, uh, briefly if you can share this story with us. Well, so uh, this is the, the ring, you saw the uh, picture of the finished ring in, uh, earlier on, uh, but here it is on my workbench in the process. So I made uh, the basic ring uh, shank that had to fit the customer's finger because that had to be right uh, once I'd uh, built on it. There's no way of altering the size, so I hope her hand doesn't change <laughs> over the years. Um, but so the, the basic tube had to fit her finger and then I made uh, the, uh, the basic shape, uh, the bridge if you like, over it uh, and below. And then I made each individual building um, basically in silver, some have a kind of cladding of gold. Uh, it's a bit more than, well, a, a veneer, but it's more than plating. It's actually a and did you work? Of gold. Did you work from photos she gave you, or did you go to visit yes. the places? Uh, well, as it happens, Oxford is my hometown on which this is based, so I'm very familiar with Oxford, uh, luckily. So I suppose it, it struck a chord for me too. Um, uh, but yes, I worked from photographs and she sent me pictures of her house and her road. Uh, and when you sit at the bench, do you try to uh, put yourself in the shoes of the client and imagine the emotions she was feeling? Or how do uh, you work a that bit. together? That, that probably as it did, comes over when you meet the client and they're talking about what they'd like you to make. And you get a, a very firm impression of the importance of this moment in their lives. Um, uh, and also either as in her case, she was really clear about what she wanted and how she wanted it to look. Beyond that, of course, I, I did lots of drawings. You can see them there. Uh, and on the left, drawings from each direction and an aerial view. So I had to just imagine out of thin air how this would be, uh, in, trying to include a long ingredients list of things to be included. Um, but yes, lots right. of planning, as of course Brad would obviously do, um, but planning in every detail so that I know what I'm going to do before I launch into silver and gold. After mm -hmm. all, they're expensive materials. You don't want to waste them. Right. Uh, so one of the things that I um, uh, always find fascinating is that creative mind's eyes don't see the world the same way we do. There's, there's no doubt about that. And every time I speak to a different um, artist or architect or anyone in, in creative, I am astonished by that. So I was wondering if we could have a bit of a teachable moment. And Brad, when I'm looking at this photo, I know nothing about architecture. And what I see is um, lines and rectangles. I can imagine volumes. So can you, can you teach us what should we be looking at when we see a building such as this one that is so simple, but I'm sure is perfect. It's, it's one of yours. So. <laughs> uh, what should I be looking at? What are the details that make um, such a building exceptional and all those who know say it's amazing? Uh, well, that's... Uh... Deep question, I guess. Um, the uh, you know for me, it, it, you know, the, it's a resolving. It's always about resolving a problem. So the the in terms of you have to know 
how things are going to go together, you know, how much money do you have to spend? Uh, this, this is an earlier project of mine. So it's, it's, it was um, a relatively low budget. It was in Indiana, outside of Indianapolis, which is not known for its um, uh, progressive, uh, you know, design sensibilities in the area. Uh, in, in fact, when this house was done, there was a line of cars out in front of it every weekend for people to drive by and look at it because they had never seen anything like it before. Um, but the, and, and then the, uh, there was a group of architects that asked I'd come down and give a talk about how I was able to accomplish this in the Indianapolis area. But behind, uh, so this is wood and brick um, and the, 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 the paler, lighter horizontal movement you're seeing there is, is um, wood. And then uh, behind that is a very large brick volume that follows down a hill. And so the, the, the structure has to be resolved uh, in terms of doing that. But then you go back and you look at what is the composition. And you know, so a, a lot of what I do is kind of a, like a painterly composition in terms of proportions um, and what looks good. And then being able to match that with the structure that's been developed. And uh, that comes from um, a long uh, time and experience of knowing what works and what doesn't in terms of, you know, what you can do in terms of building materials and what you can do in terms of structure and what you can do uh, in, in terms of um, composition. So uh, this is all about composition in terms of the facade. Um, and then once you get into the house, it opens up to light and views and that type of thing, but it's meant to be very private. And do you, um, do you seek feedback? I mean, you've, you've been, um, you have a business partner, you created, you founded the, uh, the practice in 89, I think. So you must have a strong working relationship. Do you use him or as a, a sounding board and say, you know, I, I, I don't know, this is quite right. Can you have a look at it? Does it work like that or are you? Sometimes, yes. You know, if it's, if it's a really strong uh, concept, um, I just keep moving forward with it. But, uh, you know, I, I'm always looking for uh, an educated opinion. You know, anybody can have an opinion, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a good one. So the, um, uh, you know, I look from, a, from a, a point of critical analysis. And I, I also think that I'm also very self-critical, which I think is important. Uh, with any kind of art form, um, you have to say, is that, you know, is that really good? What else can we do? Can you edit it down? Uh, you know, and, and, and that's something that, you know, I do every day. Mm. I mean, so simple um, design to be perfect. There's, there's nowhere to hide. It's sometimes when it's full of um, decorative element and all that, you can, I think you can probably get people to just say, oh, it's beautiful only on the visual, but um, be a little bit lazy and no, not look behind it. But on something like that, there's really nowhere to hide. <laughs> so right. um, perfection yeah. is important. Uh, Vicky, we looked at this, uh, at this box uh, from the other side earlier. And what were, what were the challenges of creating this piece for you? Uh, and when I'm looking at it, what should I be looking for to say that's an exceptional um, piece of jewelry? Uh, well, it, it's a box rather than a, a piece of jewelry, right. I suppose. Uh, and to give you a size, it's a, do you want inches? It's about three inches long uh, uh, at the widest. Um, uh, the building uh, as, as it is in real life, the tower is freestanding from the from the main body of the building. And I've kind of pushed it into the main building so that to make it look as if it belongs to it. Um, as a real building, of course, it looks fine, but isolated out of its context, it looked very strange. So I, I moved the tower closer into the building. Uh, and the, the dome in real life has most wonderful uh, Baroque pattern design on the inside which I inverted, the, the client asked me to do that. So to represent that design, but so it could be seen from the outside. Uh, so there's the, the pattern etched onto a flat disc that I then domed into a semi uh, uh, hemisphere. Um, 
And so I've got all the elements of the building, but not necessarily as Christopher Wren intended in the first place. I right. hope he would approve. <laughs> uh, and it, it was this particular building for the uh, the Lord Mayor of London that year, about three years ago. And he's an architect and this is his favorite building. Uh, and apparently he was absolutely delighted. Uh, oh, that's great. So, uh, I get a lot of pleasure out of, um, um, as I said, manipulating proportions or altering things that in a way that actually even somebody who knows the building well doesn't notice what I've done to it, but I hope it stands on its own. So Brad, when you look at something like that, do you look at it with uh, architect eyes or you look at it with the eyes of someone who doesn't know anything or possibly doesn't know much about silversmith and, and how do you look at this? Uh, well, I look at it aesthetically as a work of beauty. I, I think that, um, you know, the, Thank you. the, the, the um, uh, it's not architecture in the sense that it's a, it's a building project. It, it's an architectural form that has its own, you know, reality in terms of the, in, in terms of the, the material and the size and, and, and whatever. And I recognize um, that it's not literal uh, you know, in, in terms of your interpretation of it, but I think that's great. I mean, I think that there's there's a um, uh, that's what the art is. I mean, if you were just building replicas and miniatures, I, I think that'd be a, a whole other ball game. But I think that um, yeah. there, you can see that there's a certain quality to your work uh, that comes through aesthetically, and uh, that's your own, and uh, and that's very that's that's great. Thank you. I, I made a, a ring once uh, based on an uh, inner city region of London called the Barbican. It's 1970s development of lots of high towers. Um, and uh, the client lives in an apartment in that area. And in the middle of the towers is uh, an old Victorian church called St Giles's. And I put that church in the middle of these towers. And it's the church that's recognizably a church that gives reference to the rest being um, a, a apartment blocks mm -hmm. because otherwise it would look like the, a lot of um, vertical oblongs uh, and a selection of vertical forms but it still needs something to reference the fact that it's architecture mm -hmm. so that was important to me um, that, it, that it had that reference a lot of modern architecture that I'd love to work on, but wouldn't necessarily scale down to my purpose and still read as architecture. Mm -hmm. One yeah. of the, uh, sorry, go ahead. I, just, I, I like the work, it's great. Thank you, Good. thank you. <laughs> um, the haptic touching, it's very easy in, in jewelry, that's, that's what it is about. Uh, but in in a home, it's a little bit more complicated, possibly. Um, I just put these two uh, photos side by side. Um, this ring goes on the hand. It's you know it's carried on. I think you can, if you have a little bit of uh, courage, or if if you <clears throat> excuse me don't care about what people think of you, you can wear it even going to the supermarket. Um, <laughs> These are well protected <laughs> on a dark night. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, this interior, to me, um, looks like it is it is precious and not necessarily something where I would want to put my hands and and uh, touch things. I mean, I possibly have been traumatized by a mother who would scream at us every time we put our hands on the walls. And I suspect I might have um, I might have done the done the same to my uh, to my children, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and to their friends. Um, Brad, how do we bring that um, connection, that touch, into a home while making it precious and beautiful, as as we we've seen on this image? Uh, well. The and the particular image that you showed, um, it, it, I think, was for your mother. Um, <laughs> the the um, uh, the client is uh, uh, 
you know, if, if he, he's a graphic artist and if you looked at his desk, you know, all his papers are exactly ordered and, and uh, all the pencils and pens in, in, in a particular place. So that that's the client. Um, uh, not, I can't, I don't think you can go to all our interiors and see the same thing. Uh, I did a very modern, uh, very large house out in the country outside and for um, a family and the oldest daughter was blind. And uh, so they wanted to have uh, one of the, 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 the program points was that they wanted an indoor pool because the, the, she loved to swim, but she kept running into other kids when she was swimming uh, in, in the public pool. And one of the things that um, we did was we textured, there was a lot of concrete in the house and there's a lot of wood millwork in the house. And there was other like textile, uh, tactile materials that we used in the house that were monumental, not like plaster and not a lot of plaster and chipboard, or, or at least not in touchable locations. But she used the tactile of the material as a locator in terms of moving through the house. And, uh, and her handprints were all over everything. So the, you know, in, intentionally, and, uh, and it didn't affect the material uh, in, in terms of the use because of the substantial materials that we use there. And you could say that, um, you know, they look cold and uh, 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 not inviting perhaps, you know, to some that would prefer a more, a more traditional interior, uh, but it really worked for them and it particularly worked for her uh, in, in terms of being able to live in the house comfortably. Mm. Um, do your clients wear their uh, their pieces every day, Vicky? I mean, the ring that I sh just showed on uh, on the photo. I think you have it with you on your desk, no, or, or, or a similar one. Uh, uh, it's gone now to the to the client. Uh, that one is uh, based on um, a selection of buildings in um, Iceland. Uh, it's an Art Deco church and then traditional turf houses. Uh, and uh, um, Iceland, although she lives in England, Iceland, for some reason, is very uh, important to her. Uh, some people do wear pieces all the time. Um, I don't think they put them on, especially for me, when they know they're going to see me. Now, I think they, they do wear them all the time, in some cases, perhaps not the rings all the time, although some people, some people do. One, one man has a ring that he wears on each finger. Uh, of mine, right. uh, it's quite a sight. Uh, so yeah, but it tends to be the more modest and smaller things, wearable, every everyday wearable things. Right. Yeah. Um, we're almost at the end of our uh, of our time, and before we, uh, we we say goodbye, I have to ask you the question, Brad. If you had to uh, build the uh, your your dream building, what what would it be? Uh, a fishing cabin, I would say. In Canada, because I forgot to say that you are Canadian. <laughs> I, I, I do have uh, dual citizenship. Yes. Very simple, no, no, no grand, uh, no grand building. Well, you know, the, you can ask a lot of architects that question; they're all going to say the same thing. The next one. The yes. next one. <laughs> okay. Do you do you like? just being left alone and uh, are you a very social person or are you someone who just likes to uh, recharge through quiet time and, and solitude? Uh, I like to take a few days off a year. Um, typically I would, I actually would go up to uh, Canada, but not this year. Actually, I'm going up there this weekend. What am I talking about? I'm going uh, this weekend, which is uh, not easy to do. Um, yeah. with all the rules and regulations, but um, I'm going up to the family cottage just for a couple of days and then um, in the Gatineau Hills. And then, oh, nice. uh, mm -hmm. and then um, uh, uh, in terms of social, I, I entertain a lot um, and, you know, cocktail parties and everything. I, by the way, I live in a very traditional apartment um, <laughs> and, and uh, it's 110 years old and all the moldings and so forth. Uh, but I also have a very large art collection, so that, that um, you know, I, I can, uh, you know, it, it makes it more personal to me, I guess. But the, the, this is, and I moved in here a couple of months ago, 
um, and it's in a, a, the downtown area of Chicago. And this is the first time I've ever lived in a um, in a traditional environment. So, um, and, and the thing that I like about it is that there aren't too many windows. Um, and I was never able to hang so much art. And I, I can hang six times the art that I, I, I ever had the space for before. So I'm kind of happy about that. So do you wake up feeling different in the morning because you are in, in a house that has that whole history and, and, and all these generations that have lived in it? Um, I don't necessarily feel that way. I wake up in the morning well rested because um, the last apartment I had was right next to the L track. And so um, oh. I was woken up five times a night by the train going by. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that I'm in a very quiet place right now. <laughs> and you, Vicky, what would be the building that you would want to, uh, to, to put on a ring? I'd have to take a closer look at Brad's buildings. <laughs> I, I did that would a, be a I fun think, collaboration. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I did a ring for uh, an architect in Washington who asked me to do her whole opus on a big ring along the same lines as that Oxford one, but it has her Washington buildings and New York buildings. Um, so uh, yeah, that was quite a collection of uh, very contemporary buildings. Mm. Um, other than that, if I was revisiting Italy, uh, somewhere I've, I've never actually uh, worked on is building in Florence. Uh, the Patsy Chapel. It's a gem of a building. Um, I think mm -hmm. it is that, that uh, are those Aldo Rossi drawings you have behind you? The towers? Uh, the towers, yes. That no, that would be that would be terrific. Isn't, isn't that the, the drawing that you have right behind you to your uh, uh these these towers here, yes. Uh, uh, that's right, they're various different campanile from uh, uh, Siena, mostly Siena and and Venice. Uh, they're actually brooches that are uh, sort of long, narrow brooches, but about six inches tall. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. Great. Well, thank you so very much. Um, I think it was a surprising uh, combination and uh, you really showed us both sides of your, uh, of your art. It was a real pleasure. Thank you all. I don't see any questions. So I'm assuming that you have all been uh, uh, enthralled by what we have heard. And uh, thank you for being here today. It was wonderful to have you, a lot of you today. Thank you, and, Isabel, uh, and thank you for introducing us, Brad. It's been a pleasure to meet you. Likewise. Thank you. Uh, our next event is actually this Friday. We're going to London to the Linnean Society uh, as part of the summer series. And the Linnean Society is where uh, specimens from Linnaeus were kept. And this is also where uh, a lot of the Darwin collection is. And next week, we're going to Cornwall and Devon, where we're going to meet four makers, including a jeweler, Lucy Spink, who is going to welcome us in her uh, garden. So thank you all and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Brad and Vicky, again, thank you so very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.